Yo, and you're at the Tushar show. This is part two of the series podcast with Ryan Escoville. With I think it's a four or five series podcast with Ryan Escoville, the U.S. Army war veteran. He's also the host of two podcasts, the Escovillio Show and Escoville Money. I'm going to lead you straight to the podcast today. Uh, if you've not heard part one, then I recommend you hear part one because that is an introduction of Ryan and uh, you get to know him better. If you want to hear this podcast by itself, uh, you will find some messages in it. But this was uh, this is actually one long podcast divided into five parts so that it is easy to consume and uh, you were able to digest the content and the meaning of Ryan's words more easily because it's a heavy podcast and uh, you'll see why. So continue ahead if you've heard part one. Otherwise, I recommend you hear part one or if you want to hear part two and then go to part one, that's fine too. Have a nice listen. Very, it was very nice listening to you speak. And, oh, thank uh, you. Yes, I mean, uh, I'm just, I just like to hear you. I mean, everything that's coming out is so pure. It, it feels very nice to just listen to you speak. That, that's, that's the only line I can say. Uh, <laughs> uh, then, so this is, this is how you carry a sense of service into your daily work too you you apply the wisdom and the learnings that you learned throughout life i mean from the battle after losing your friend and uh, i mean after going through depression i mean you've had a long journey how do you maintain sanity and how do you serve people especially because uh, my audience doesn't know this you you you're in the communication field or you you're in an office and you told me you're like the nexus veterans call you on the phone and uh, you you're like an attendant for a helpline and you help them connect to the next person now again there there are two three ways of doing this one is like talking to yourself and telling yourself that this job sucks I could always be doing something better and being in that frame of mind and attending to the veterans and just doing your job and the second could be that understanding like you said that the people who are calling me are calling me to teach me a lesson or to help me practice the values which I have to inculcate and imbibe within myself and you could use it as a you could use it as a practice session to become a better human every call so why do you choose to do that and i mean how do you do that how, how are your calls how do you attend to the veterans and what what attitude do you carry forward with yourself while doing your daily job in office well i i think of it as water you know i have i have water and the okay. people who are calling need water why do they need water well is it <laughs> because they're thirsty is it because they're dehydrated mm -hmm. do they need nutrition do they need you know there's there's limits of course there's always limits in life but there's mm -hmm. also limits in my job and mm -hmm. when we live within those limits mm -hmm. Um, we explain to people, okay, these are the limits of what I can do for you. Okay. And and help you with, you know. Okay. And within these limits, they understand how this how the, how these limits work. If it's too far to the left or if it's too far to the right, they mm -hmm. they get beyond those limits, and there's nothing more I can do. Even though their expectations of me giving them water, giving them more water, but what happens mm -hmm. when you give somebody too much water? They can die. Right. You know, it's unlikely, of course, but, you know, and when you do this for 
anybody. You do this for veterans, do this for women, do this for men, children, and you give them too much. You know, that's bad for them. So then you just give them enough for them to learn and grow and then for them to think for themselves mm -hmm. and then say, okay, I'm done. You know, maybe I need some soda. Maybe I need a Coke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, a, you know, and they're using the water analogy. And then uh -huh. knowing that that water is not unlimited. You know? And then right. water is very helpful to help you. It's not helping you get healthy. It's helping you see things clearly. Okay. And people can't see past their own self. Okay. So, uh, I w just for a little more clarity, which question are you answering? Well, mainly for what I do. So, I, I for what I do is I set limits on their expectations of mm -hmm. what they think the veterans, veterans Affairs is there for. Okay. So, okay. education to mental health services. Mm-hmm. Those are within the limits. I right. can't make your life better. I can't make mm -hmm. your. I can't bring back people from the dead. Right. I can't give you hope. You know, I can give you right. a process where you restore hope for yourself. Right. You know, and then I can give you a roadmap of right. the people who I think that you think that you know. And then those expectations are either met or they're not met, or they become bigger expectations. <laughs> And that right. personal responsibility kicks in and hopefully their life is better. But right. that doesn't happen all the time. And they become mm. dependent. And when you become dependent on any, anything and everything, that's bad. Right. So you have to live within right. those limits. Right, right. And I was I was asking, how do you carry uh, the how do you carry the mentality of your service towards these veterans who you are, who you are talking to every day. Well, I have to do it anonymously, so I can't mm -hmm. tell them I'm a veteran. I can't tell them my name, or I can't mm -hmm. tell them, you know, this is what I think you should do. So mm -hmm. what I what I say to them is, what do you want me to do? Right. You know, tell me, you know, how I can be of service, and I'll tell you what I can do. Right. Know? To meet those expectations and if I can do it right. here's the person here's the person I'm gonna connect you with here's your mm -hmm. roadmap this is where mm -hmm. you need to go right and and then hopefully you know they get the services that they've earned right yeah. right and how do you display compassion on the phone you build um, you build empathy and empathy okay. is very similar to compassion mm -hmm. but you have I mean, for people who are in the service, you you have to disconnect, you know. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times, then reconnect. Then you 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 use words. It's like, right. oh, I I I completely understand what you're asking of me, and right. then say what they're asking. So your 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 understanding of what they're needing, so much right. minus the emotion, minus the the hopelessness. You know, right, and because it's, right. they have to understand there's a process, right? And that right. process, you know, takes time. So, uh, from what I'm understanding, you you often get a lot of calls. You you get a lot of calls, in which the veterans who are calling you are are hopeless. They have lost faith in themselves, in the general process in life, and uh, they call you and they they kind of went it all out on you yes and they want a solution they want a fix for life which isn't there because they have to do that for themselves in in, in a way but there it's not mm -hmm. so much the, it's not so much the emotion of needing help it's mm -hmm. the it's the um, the technical of listening you know, right. there, there's no emotion in listening. Right. But there's a, a lot of emotion in speaking. Right. So if and you can't speak and listen at the same time, it's impossible. So right. if if one person is listening and the other one's speaking, that energy mm -hmm. is moving. Right. Know? So it's not all bottled up inside where they're actually going to explode or, or uh, unfortunately kill themselves. So 
mm-hmm. where I listen and I pick up mm-hmm. on keywords like hopelessness, depression, suicide. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, it shortens the time where I need to act. So I need to right. get a hold of this person. Mm-hmm. And while they're speaking, I could mm-hmm. be calling people. I could, you know, of course, listen. Right. You know, shorten that time of what mm-hmm. this, of, of getting a counselor, you know, and right. getting, right. getting them to the right place. Right, right, right. Essentially, saving saving time and saving their life before they take a rash decision. Right. Shorten that time. Efficiency. So I, I can use efficiency. See, there's, no, mm-hmm. there's not a whole lot of emotion in efficiency, time management, um, calling people. There's no, no, no emotion. So like that balance of emotion versus efficiency you know, in my capacity of service, I can, you know, use that time, use that efficiency, use those uh, connections mm-hmm. to provide faster service, more meaningful right. service. There you go. Right, right. But what happens, you know, like, like I say, it, you do that for so long, you lose your own se- sense of purpose. You lose your own sense of what do I need to take care of me? Right, you know? right. Um, That's where self-care comes in. Right. Because only when you can take care of yourself can you take care of others. Right. And that's the first thing they teach you in the military is if if you can't take care of yourself, how do you expect, realistically expect to take care of somebody else? Right. And when the bullets are flying, the bombs are dropping, and you have no time to feel emotion and you have no time to breathe and you have no time for anything else. Right. You know, you you have to act. For your own self-preservation. Right. Right. So it, it truly is a balance. I mean, I don't think that's the best way I can explain it. Uh, it's a balance. Mm-hmm. You have to take get care out of, of balance. yourself mm-hmm. and you have to take care of them. And uh, you have to take care of them enough so that you don't dra- feel drained. Right. Well, you you teach them to take care of themselves. Right, right. So, Understood. That's how you maintain Understood. that balance. Instead of making them feel dependent on you or the service, you f- you try to make them, uh, you teach them to be dependent on their own. Take care of themselves. Right. Right. Very nice. Awesome. Could you could you tell me how was it during the war? How was the war? How how do you describe it? Well, going to war is much like going on a plane uh, like you're gonna go on a vacation or something so we okay. took a, a commercial airliner to okay you know, very nice airport and then and the only really only difference is that you're in a uniform and you're, you have weapons and you know, you're actually going to fight right so in that sense so how, you know, it's, how, it's, how was it when when you first got the news like from the start like you're going to war when you heard that how, how was the emotion was it like yeah everybody's going so uh, i've got no choice so i'm not thinking about it too much or wa- was it something of a shocker no it it, it wasn't a shocker um i had that sense mm-hmm. of purpose and service because i had joined the military mm-hmm. to and i i knew that there's a possibility of going to war so right. those 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 ideas weren't too far out of the norm. So right. at any moment we could go to war and it's right. you know, you're in the service of your nation. So you're expected to go to war. So that's what we did. Right. right. And where you went in the okay. airplane. So we, we landed in Kuwait city. I don't know if you've ever been to Kuwait city. It's, no, it's no. a very, 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 very nice uh, airport. Okay. Um, or did we land a military base? It might have been a military base, but I, 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 I've been to Kuwait City and very nice airport, very, very likable okay. people. So there's nothing okay. too far out of the out of the norm. And then, you know, it's very paperwork. There's a lot of crossing the T's and dotting the I's and making sure your life insurance is up to date. So it's it's very um, administrative. Um, okay. And it's, People think it's like a movie. You know, you jump on an airplane you get, and you jump out of an airplane 
and you land in a right. combat zone. That's far. Right. From, it's far from reality. And then, right. Um, so we get there, and then we do all our paperwork and make sure things. And then we go across the border into Iraq. So, okay. And, and there are no snacks and everything lined up there. Yes, everything's okay. everything's lined up and ready to drive through, and no one ever says, "Okay, now the war starts now." It, it okay. doesn't work that way. <laughs> So you're okay. you're still in a mindset where okay I don't think this is real yet, uh -huh. but it's still a war, right? So after about I don't know three or four months, you know, we, uh, life adjusts to the culture right. and and not and then, I don't know if you ever been to Iraq or even know, not your assumptions is everybody's Muslim or and then that's not that's far from the truth. Because you have Muslims, you have Christians, you have Kurds. There's very, very uh, diverse a uh, population there. So, mm -hmm. you know, the reality sets in that mm -hmm. it is a war when the bullets so, are flying and bombs. So when did that happen? Did that happen after four months of you being there? No, that happened about I want to say about seven months. When and how long were you there? I was there for a little over a year, 12 months, 13 months. Okay. 12, about 12, 12 and a half months. There you go. Um, okay. But it wasn't until like about a seventh month. There you go. Until I got blown up, you know, when it, when it directly affected me. And I'm like, whoa, okay. this this is real. You know, this, what happened? <laughs> this what is happened? Real. What happened? What happened was we were driving down the highway. It's much like any other highway. And, Anywhere you go, it's very modern. So, right. and then a bomb goes off, and okay. then like whoa, right underneath the truck. So, and this is this is a it wasn't a I mean it was it was a good sized bomb. It it made uh -huh. me black out, and then I returned fire. But then after right. it seemed like hours, but it maybe went seconds. But at the, the time, it's just so backwards, where, and then uh, so it might. Have, it been a couple, a couple seconds, minutes, but I was totally out. And then I, I came to, I, I grabbed my gun and I fired. I was the guy on the top that you see in the movies firing the gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there you go. So I was firing the gun, and then all of a sudden I, I, I realized that there's, there's nobody firing him. I need to stop, so cause I, I don't oh. want to hurt nobody. So okay. And it actually hit me, you know. But thankfully, you know, I'm, I'm so humble and grateful that I, I only got minor injuries from that. So Ryan has started speaking about his war experiences and uh, at the other end of the computer, the other, uh, at the other end of the world, I'm wondering what questions do I ask him, what do I not? Because uh, anybody who's experienced war goes through a um, mental disorder known as PTSD, Post Traumatic Stress, stress Disorder. And... Uh, asking questions and re-evoking memories uh, sometimes is not the best thing to do when you know someone has PTSD and I was trying to ask the right questions just enough to uh, not trigger a memory or something that stresses him out but thankfully he was comfortable enough in a comfortable uh, frame of mind to answer my questions uh, maybe because he has uh, been through it and he he has a stable perspective of the events that have happened even though they are very traumatic and uh, the part the section about war is actually divided into three so in the five series podcast there are three parts just specifically speaking about war so uh, that's how intense it is and that's why it's divided so that you can take a break you can think about what he said and get back onto the next podcast and it's like an educational experience i would like to thank ryan a lot and uh i i just like to thank ryan yeah otherwise news from uh tushar studios is a uh, special shout out to Paul McCartney and uh, 
yeah fascinating person uh paul you made some good music <laughs> okay uh more special shout out special shout out to madhulika mohan she is one of my guests on the good vibes podcast i think that was episode number 33 uh constraints and when i look at it uh in my life currently i find myself facing a lot of constraints like i want to uh practice jazz or uh, in the sense uh it could be it could be constraints such as not uh not earning on the podcast so when that's a constraint uh when you hear the podcast and hear what she says she says that sometimes constraints are placed to allow you to become creative and find a better way to get what you want and i really like that saying so even even around the drum kit i give myself i'm trying i'm trying to place constraints that i'm going to play just around these grooves or around these toms and uh try to form new beats maybe i'll make you hear them in one of the coming podcasts but uh that was a nice episode and uh yep and also maybe a new word for you to think about officium officium it is a home or office and a museum <laughs> yep that in, that is a self created word officium so i am trying to i have made my room a kind of a officium officium h o f f i c l i u m but i need to keep it neat so if ever you come to my room i'll be handing out tickets for you it's 50 pounds for a visit see you at tusha studio some day the officium the official official <laughs> officium of the tusha empire see you in the next podcast uh i know i lightened the tone i lightened the mood a little but the message will 